I'm Meredith Cathcart with the Department of Education, the Special Education Division, Administrator of Policy Program Services, and Early Education. My name is Erin Paulson. I work at the Department of Developmental Services, and I oversee the local implementation of the Early Start Program. I do all the monitoring um, with my team, and I also oversee the Medicaid Weaver. Thank you. I'm Sharon Walsh, and I'm a visitor and happy to be invited. Thank you. And I'm Cecilia Fisher-Doms, and I'm the uh, Quality Improvement Administrator of the Early Education and Support Division in the Department of Education, California Department of Education. Okay, so um, what we know about um, working together is about partnerships and relationships. And so we know from what Sharon said that those partnerships and relationships are at the federal level through education and health and human services, is at the state level between Cecilia and myself, and we know it's at the local level as well. So it's those partnerships that are important. On the post-its, I would like you to write challenges to inclusion. What stops us from going further with our inclusive practices? And there's a sheet we're passing around, is, and you can put your post-its on the sheet. Is it about attitudes, policies, funding and resources, or professional development? So if you would do that activity while we are walking through. So we want to bring to you the national look, the state look, and then you're going to give us the local look. And we've introduced the folks already, so. How many people in the room are from general education side and special education side? Great. So it's clear. The research is clear that inclusion works. The priorities at the federal level, with our national organizations, it's clear that it is supported and it is a priority. And yet, over the past 27 years, we've only increased 5% in an inclusion, inclusive practices. So our track record isn't too good. So what does it mean for us as we reflect on California. In January 2014, a national study was conducted to find out about what are the barriers and what is going on around inclusion because we haven't had much progress. And these are the results of the challenges, with attitudes and beliefs still being the top barrier. And you can see the others. So that's why I've divided our challenges into these four boxes as we go forward with our discussion. And now Sharon with a national perspective. Thank you, Meredith. This is just very briefly, these are kind of tools. Can I have the clicker? Thank you, that's okay. These are kind of legislative and policy tools that you can use that are things you really know about, but We'll look a little bit at the data, that, what the data tell us nationally, and then we'll go ahead and just talk about three pieces of legislation that you want to make sure you use as appropriate because they're really helpful toward the goal we're all em embarking upon. If we look at the national data for Part C, birth to three, we see, and these are means by state, state means, 95% of children in birth to three across the country receive, primarily receive, most of their services in a natural environment, which could be home or it could be a community setting. So as far as the data are nationally, that's, that's a pretty good percentage. Now there are always issues with data and data collection, but that's where we are with the birth to three program. Preschoolers, there's two measures we've got that we look at. One is the percentage of students with IE or children with IEPs who attend a regular ed program and receive the majority of their services in that program. So they're in some kind of a group 
or a program during the day, and Meredith could tell you many things about the difficulty and the problems with these data. But they are collected nationally by state. They're aggregated up, and these are the national numbers. But I want to make sure I say, Meredith, there's great concern about them. 50% is the mean of the children who are attending some early childhood program and receiving the majority of their preschool special ed services there. And then the next measure is also for preschool, and that's a mean. And this is the one, frankly, that disturbs me more than any of the others. I'll just speak for myself, and you decide, because I think that that previous bullet has a little issue. But the one that says the mean, 22% of preschoolers attend a separate class, school, or residential facility. Now, that's national. Okay, so that kind of gives you a pause a minute to think about those numbers. Let's look at Head Start. We've got early Head Start data. Thank you. Early Head Start data, 12.6% of children in early Head Start are children with IFSPs, and 12.3% of children in Head Start have an IEP. And we'll have another bullet to add next year when you see in the preschool grant those slots because you know that you're requi you'll be required and held accountable for data on that. A couple of red federal laws, and we're going to just take about five minutes and do this. If you think Americans with Disabilities Act, think 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, well, think Head Start, certainly, because that's got its own requirements, and then think IDEA. And it sounds like most of us are pretty familiar with the IDEA requirements, so we'll just briefly touch on them. But remember that every state has their own requirements that relate to, really to civil rights and advocacy and inclusion. And you have the best resource in the country here with your child care um, law center right here in California. So we put their link in, make sure that you know they're there. How many of you use their resource and, and access their information? Good. And the rest of you really, if you, if you click on no other link, I would really suggest you do that. Um, because state requirements, particularly when it comes to civil rights, often have different standards and higher standards. They can't be lower, but higher standards than ADA or 504. So now we're going to walk through each of them very quickly. Americans with Disabilities Act, this is civil rights legislation. This has nothing to do with getting federal money. So everybody follows this. It's got titles to it, and one of the titles is called public accommodations. There's one for state and local government, and that covers schools and public schools. But I want to mostly talk for now about the one that has to do with public accommodations. And basically, it says a number of things that you just keep tucked away. So as you're working at the community level, and you're trying to create more slots or make more slots available, and you want to offer your special ed and related services in an inclusive setting, but mom or dad say to you, you know, we've been trying to get in a preschool or a child care program, or the preschool or the child care programs say to you, you know, we're just nervous, we're worried, whatever people say, think about what these programs, these laws and requirements can offer as a, as a facilitator for you. So what ADA says is, and the definition of eligibility under ADA and 504 are the same thing, and they are much broader than IDEA. Some of you are nodding because you probably know them well and could be doing this conversation, but just think of them as a disability that affects one or more life activities. And when you look at the list of life activities, it literally is everything you do from morning till night. Eating, sleeping, dressing, talking, thinking, um, anything can be a life activity. So it's a very broad, appropriately broad definition of eligibility. So what does it say about early childhood? Okay, doesn't speak to age, because it's birth through the entire age span, and it's civil rights. It guarantees reasonable modifications policies, practices, and procedures, and there's that great word again, full participation. It's access, you can't close the door, but it's way more than access, it's, it's participation. Now, the one little thing is programs that have religious affiliation are exempt from ADA, but as you tuck that away, remember that they're not exempt from 504. So if you're thinking of a particular program right now, could be a child care program that's run by a church, um, that that child care program in and of itself might be exempt from ADA, um, but it won't be from 504 if it gets federal money. So keep that in mind. Preschool programs, child care centers, and family child care homes are all covered under ADA. It doesn't matter that they're private. That's the whole point. It's, it's, it's the law that covers restaurants, movie theaters, everything, parks. So basically, for our purposes, here's a couple of things ADA says. So fundamental alteration. So the fundamental alteration just think of the difference between kinder care, children's world, all the big national corporations, 
and they've had many things they've done with ADA over the years in, in uh, concert with the Justice Department. Or the, the home, the, the neighbor that has three children come in in the day, there's a big difference between what your neighbor has to do and what the national corporation has to do. But anything that would alter the fundamental, pro and it has to make reasonable accommodations unless they're fundamental alterations, and unless it's an undue burden. You see all those things that have quotes? And there's lots of regulatory language around this. They must provide aids and services to a, for effective communication. If you want more information, there is this great FAQ. I don't know if you have it. I hope you do. It's very old, but it applies. And it's, there's a link for it. And you can call the 800 number. But it's, a, it's an FAQ that was developed years and years ago on accessing child care and the, what ADA says about child care. 504, so we'll leave ADA aside. One minute on 504. It's 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. It applies to anybody who gets any federal funds, and there's no religi religious exemption. So if you have a child care program that's religiously affiliated, and they say we don't, or a school, a private school, we're private, that's OK. But we're religious, no ADA. But if they get any federal money, and a lot of programs get food money, so if they get any federal money, child care vouch money, any voucher money, then they're covered under 504. So you got lots of vehicles. Civil rights protections against discrimination. No money comes with either ADA or 504. They're protections. They're civil rights. They have the same eligibility, and they have similar protections as Title II of ADA. So they kind of offer you the same stuff, um, and they're both there, and there's no religious exemption. You, the 504 regulations are there, and they basically say you can't discriminate. This is true for before and after school programs. If you've got a K-3 program, and it's offered, or a preschool program, a four-year-old program, you offer it to children without disabilities, you cannot exclude children with disabilities. And so, it, and that applies to preschool or adult ed. You, you offer after school for K-3, you offer after school for K-3 for students with children with disabilities as well. We all know Head Start performance standards have plenty of language about what you need to do for ch uh, children with disabilities, including assessment and meeting requirements and developing IEPs if you have to. And that's all very clear. So we have lots and lots of vehicles that we can use. The rest of the Head Start um, legislation talks about plans. You must establish disability plans. And I'm not going to do IDEA, because I know we all know it. But make sure you look. Recent guidance from the Department of Ed preschool special ed on reiterating all of the LRE requirements in preschool. And there's a lot of good policy letters that have come out over the years. If you need that, that's a good kind of one-stop place to get it all. The part, the part B regulations are very clear. Pre preschool applies. Occasionally, you still hear every once in a while, I'm sure not in California, but in another state, a school district will say, well, we don't have to really do that because we don't have universal preschool. Yes, you do. LRE applies to preschool as well. So that language is there and it's strong. And there's always Part C letters as well that are strong. The language parallels Part B and Part C for inclusion. Remember, as we said yesterday, inclusion's not in the statute or the regs. But for Part C, it's called natural environments. And for Part B, it's called least restrictive environment. And the language is almost identical. So you've got IFSP language, which very much parallels IEP language. And in Part B, you always have a continuum. It always strikes me that the, mo the easiest question, but, but I'm speaking to the choir here, I know, to say to a school district, if you're wondering, is what's your continuum for preschool? And if the answer is we have this wonderful self-contained preschool classroom, what is your response? What's your continuum for preschool? That's one point on your continuum. Where's the rest of your continuum? Oh, some children are served at home. What's my question? What's your continuum for preschool? Okay, that's it. I'm going to turn the mic over to um, Aaron, but I think you've got you were gathering tools as we go here, and those are your federal tools. Okay. Before I start, any questions for Sharon? Okay. So as she just said, national environments um, is the language in Part C of IDEA, um, and what that means in California is that we serve families where they are. And I was telling Shawnice earlier today that I worked in the nine northern counties when I started my career um, in, in this field. And that meant driving down a dirt road for two miles, lots of potholes, and turning left where they said the donkey would be, and going to the house and having to call, hopefully my cell phone will work because they said they don't want the dogs to eat you. So that was, that, that was my experience. This was, this was my introduction to it. And that was just normal. That was typical. Well, that wasn't so typical, but. Um, but I was used to going where the families were. 
being with them in their homes, talking about services, and how to serve them where they were. So when I came to the state, I was a little bit surprised that they still had these big segregated clinics and settings for our babies, that families would go and drop off their baby for treatment, and then they would go pick them up, and it was a little bit of a respite for the families. So I was surprised that, well, what about, what's the mom learning? How are they learning to, to grow and learn with their child? So when I look back at the, the legislation that was passed to bring Early Start to California, this is what's in our Early Intervention Services Act, that the family is the constant in the child's life, while the service system and personnel within those systems fluctuate, and that services should support and enhance the family's capability to meet the special needs of their infant or toddler with disabilities. So this was in 1993, and so we're still working on this. Um, and I wanted to bring you some data. Um, every year we have to submit an annual performance report, and one of our indicators is the percent of children served in the natural environment. So are they receiving a, a majority of their services in the natural environment? So you can see that we're at 75.3% on this category. And I think this is an important indicator of where we are in our system. But I think what's more important is looking at the family engagement. Every year we have to do a survey. We survey, we do a sample of 6,000 kids, a sample of 6,000 families that are receiving early intervention services. Um, it's random, it covers all areas of California, and it also um, reflects all the different ethnicities. And when we look at the three areas, we want families to know their rights, we want them to be able to effectively communicate their needs and help their children develop and learn. And in 2012, we changed to a 17 um, question survey and you can see the difference between our 2011 and 2012 results because these are probably a lot more accurate. So this is our baseline. This is where we're starting. So in that last area, help their child develop and learn, we're at 79.2%. So when you break those numbers down even more, these very important things about inclusion, families feeling a part of their community and being able to effectively communicate their child's needs, providing information about the child interacting with others, Infants and toddlers, that's mom, you know, play dates, all these things. A lot of families don't feel like that's something that's covered in their early intervention services. Sharing ideas and including child in daily activities, 78.7%. Talk to them about what they think is important, 79%. So this is a start, this is our baseline. So this really highlights some areas that we really need to improve the way we're providing services. I'm not going to talk a lot about how effective, where the science is, and what effective strategies, because you've heard that over the last two days. Um, but in California, we really like to say that NERAP, natural environments, everyday routines, relationships, activities, places, and partnerships. So this is where we need to provide early intervention services, and this is the, these are the people and the places that we need to include. And I. Um, have a bunch of resources up here. The Division of Early Childhood has um, just came out with recommended practices, and they're great. They're also in the um, Edmodo. They're on the, on the online. Um, do the math if you're still trying to convince providers that it, it is effective and it is cost effective. Um, oh, and then the seven key principles, and then the what it looks like, what it doesn't look like, they're all in the Edmodo handouts. Thank you, Erin. And I neglected, but I didn't mean to, the strong partnership we have with Erin at um, DDS and the CDE on all of our parts. So it's a, also a very important process. So um, Sharon went over what is required fairly on preschool least restrictive environment reporting. And um, so I'm going to just quickly share some of the data there. And just to give us some thought before we go locally to have some discussion about some solutions. And so th these are the categories. Are they attending a regular preschool program more than 10 hours? And regardless of where the special ed is re received, attending regular preschool less than 10 hours a week, receiving services in special education program, 
receiving services in home and locations. And these are the programs that are included in that data. So it includes kindergarten and TK and all that. So these targets were set in 07, and targets are based on the baseline data. So this was the data then. And um, so it's, it's pretty low to begin with, right? A low target. And we're not able to even meet that low target. So we have work to do in California. So that just sets our context for California. So I think, uh, excuse me. And these are um, targeted improvement activities that we've had over the years in the areas of least restrictive environment. And so we still have work to do. And now it's time for Cecilia. So uh, for a context, the Early Education and Support Division um, issues um, deliver services in two approaches. One is through direct contracts that we know with our child development um, programs that we call general child care and our state preschool programs. And then the other side is through the voucher programs that you might know through CalWORK stage one, stage, actually we don't do stage one, but stage two and three in the alternate payment programs. Um, so in terms of our contracted programs, but it would be true for the uh, voucher programs, but less so because we don't have the same kind of oversight. But we do remind them clearly in their funding terms and conditions that yes, in fact, they are responsible for um, complying with ADA because as we, what we know is that oftentimes they'll say, well, I, I can't take care of that child or whatever. And, and it's reminded that no, um, th this is actually what they are required to do. So we remind them that the, it's, we have a, a clause that anybody who is delivering services under our contracts is subject to a non-discriminatory clause. So you can't um, uh, have use some kind of excuse for that, and you have to meet all of the all of the requirements of ADA. Now earlier, Sharon had also alluded to the ADA. Uh, .gov one. Well, here's yet another site for child care information that is helpful to clarify what it really means to comply, and it does speak to those things about um, undue burden and so on that might be um, a challenge for programs. But for the most part, yes, they need to be accommodate the, accommodating those children. The other thing is that actually in the eligibility for our programs for um, subsidized care, obviously, a, a, the stipulation by law is that it's lowest income. But we have, we don't have a, a requirement that, um, um, that um, especially points out to children um, with IEPs or IFS, IFSPs, but we do say if a person goes to, if a, a, a provider is going to enroll a family, if they have two families that have the same income, then the tie goes to, in this case, to the family with a child with special needs. Um, and it's interesting that we have that actually in, um, in our um, laws about that. But when I get to this next slide, you'll see that even with this kind of a uh, sort of an advantage for enrollment, we don't see that really happening too often. So this is just with the three and four year olds. So. We, we actually, so we serve about um, 130,000 uh, three and four year olds. And so it, we've got it out here. I think this even has the little colored dot. Yes, there we go. So the three year olds and a few of them have I, IEPs. Uh, that's in state preschool. In that voucher programs that I mentioned, that number, uh, w both of those numbers are smaller. Again, in state preschool, we have a, a good number. Most of the majority of our children are in state preschool program. And again, we, we have a, a good number. Um, and then those through the voucher programs, an even smaller number. So of this 132, uh, th almost 133,000 children, we're really only serving like a half of a percent who are children with I IEPs. And this, 
this, this brings Meredith and I together because this is really appalling kind of information that um, we have a public program for children and yet um, very few are actually in those programs. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I was wondering about the application process because I know that it's, you know, it's first come, first serve or whatever the process is. So unlike Head Start, they actually look at the 10% to make sure that they're filling a certain percentage where I know that subsidized care doesn't really have that kind of standard. So to, the, to that question where, um, as she mentioned, Head Start has a threshold that you actually, your enrollment has to meet at least 10%. There isn't a comparable threshold or requirement which might make um, those individuals who are going through the enrollment process more cognizant of that. Because like I said in the earlier slide where it's actually a provision that is there for when you have equally um, families with equal income or comparable income and yet we don't, what the, that these data sh show us is, but that's not what we're really seeing happening. Because if they're there, why, if that's really the case, why aren't they in the programs? Um, what we ex what we experience, and I won't say our area, our SPKs that are a part of our district, we cannot get them to um, their response to us wanting to include our students in their classrooms is they will lose funding for those students because they they want all their slots for funding. And so we can, we have a great challenge in getting our um, own district SPKs and our CDCs won't give us slots because then they don't get money for those students. Okay, so if I'm understanding, and I'm gonna repeat back what I think I'm understanding you to say, is if the child is enrolled in say the state preschool as a state preschool slot, they would have it funded. If they were enrolled as say part of their IEP, then that isn't funded and they might be losing their funding. And so then, which we will get at an opportunity to have a further discussion, uh, is that, uh, enrollment in state preschool part of the IEP and if it and, and so if it's not necessarily there can you provide which is what we're going to be doing with the inclusion and the expansion grant hopefully is looking at ways to include children that doesn't disincentivize somebody from enrolling them but maybe you could provide those additional support services uh, but they might, might still count that child as the regular child in that spot so that they're not losing that, that um, their enrollment. Okay, we'll come back and Lucia has a question. Well, per, th this really just speaks to the complexity of the funding streams for our early education programming. With funding being so tight, if the state-funded preschool or the child care, the CCTR, is not fully enrolled, they do not make their contract. They cannot pay even the measly salaries that the staff is receiving. Right. Therefore, we cannot hold spots open waiting for IEPs to happen. And then when the IEPs do take place, if the children do not meet the income, family size, and sometimes need eligibility, then it doesn't matter what the IEP says, the state preschool program cannot pay for that portion. So therefore then as an administrator for the early childhood program, you've got to open up additional classrooms and have additional seats open and maybe have special education pay the proportionate tuition rate, so to speak, if it's part of the IEP. It gets very, very complex, both programmatically and financially. And sometimes we don't have the staffing at the salary and compensation level with the complexity and skills to handle all of that. Right, and and um, this is exactly, when, when we talk about the federal preschool expansion grant, and we're keeping our fingers crossed that California will be fortunate enough to, to receive that grant, we actually have written into that that there will be teams of people who will uh, look and explore both those eligibility issues about getting in as well as those fiscal braiding and blending, those kinds of things, so we can actually have successful inclusion kinds of things. But so we're saying, not that we have an answer. Right? The 
the expansion grant did say that there was an income cap on it, right? Well, we're working on what those expansion dollars will do, but we would look to look at the extent to which we can do braiding and blending of funding. The expansion dollars, yes. But I'm sorry for those people who aren't it. That's what we're saying. And 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 I know I I don't want to beat it, but we at this point are considering opening up our own preschools to be able to accommodate our students because the barriers to using the district, this system are such a, they won't, we, they won't play with us. And the, and the grant is for full day. Well, SPK is a three hour a day program. So, I mean, I just hope the state understands the barriers are significant. And the reason the numbers are that way is not because we don't want to do it. But as we, if it, the district cannot afford to, the children one under IDA cannot be made to meet those qualifications in order to be accepted. And two, there's no funds to pay that tuition. That, there's no funds for us to pay that slot. So it's it's a significant issue. I don't know if the rest of you, but I mean, it, it, all the other stuff would come really well if, but right now we can't get a slot. Yeah. Okay, and the question is SPK, you're using a. Okay, and state preschool, and, and generally the acronym I use is is CSPP with its California State Preschool Program, which is the one that's, that we used. But, so you might use a different one, yeah, okay. That was a good question, okay. So, um, there you go, you were already there. <laughs> there are certainly barriers um, to, uh, for inclusion in our subsidized programs. Um, the, re the requirements to meet a specific income or need category, there is provision within state preschool program that allows for a, cer a certain percentage of, f of families to be over income, but that doesn't um, allow for the breadth that you would say that, say, Head Start does. It allows for the 10% and then income is not an issue. So there's not parallel between those kinds of things. And for full day, there is a need. For part day, there is not a need category. And, and so there is maybe some way to accommodate that. Um, so that's the children with IFSP or I, IEPs don't meet a need category, but that would be for full day, full year for at least for three and four year olds. For three and four year olds without a need, they would be eligible for part day, part year, um, or school year, uh, state preschool programs. But the, a comparable one doesn't exist for infants and toddlers. There isn't like, you know, an earlier state, so you don't have that one, the no need category for infants and toddlers. And then the program, lack of knowledge on how to accommodate children with disabilities uh, and are hesitant to provide those services. So it goes back to that, those same concerns about ADA that the, uh, the and, and our, our other keynote, uh, what, with the fear of the unknown, just because you don't know. And so people are hesitant to figure out ways to make this happen. Uh, we do, we have really tried to work at um, helping our providers have a better understanding. We've pro uh, provided the document that's called Inclusion Works. It's a very user-friendly um, uh, text. And, um, and there's lots of helpful things regarding that. There are PowerPoints on the uh, CaliforniaInclusion.org, um, California map. Anyway, there's even ways to make that um, so you could use that with uh, your teachers and so on to make that reasonable and viable and to look at what the options are. There's also training that's provided um, called Beginning Together for the Inclusion of Infants and Toddlers. Um, and there is the California map for uh, inclusive child care, which provides a wealth of, of resources and connections that are very helpful to use. And then um, you might not be as familiar, but we have also have the California uh, Inclusion and Behavior Consultation Network, which has um, a network up and down the, the state 
of uh, inclusion and, and behavior consult uh, consultants who assist not with resolving the child's problem, but with as assist the um, the teacher with how can I uh, make this work better for my child. I'm having a, ch a challenging time with this child with, with challenging behaviors or whatever. So it's not therapeutically dealing with the child's problem. It's finding ways which that might be the environment, the kinds, the uh, visual cues, all of those kinds of things. It provides guidance and provides linkages for people. So we've made an effort, but um, I think we, we clearly have lots more to do. Uh, and I appreciate the concerns about the disincentive on the f on the funding side and how if, if we could work to make make that happen. The one little thing I will say is that um, our California state our our funded programs, our contracted programs, not the voucher side, but the contracted programs are subject to a a flat rate to a um, a standard reimbursement rate, which is um, grossly um, inadequate for meeting the salary requirements, the adult child ratios, and those kinds of things. And at least the legislature has recognized that with the preschool um, QRS block grants, but, um, but that continues to be a big part of the fiscal challenges with doing that. Okay, well, we come to the part where you get to be involved here. Okay. Okay, now we're going to have some time to talk together and get some local solutions and ideas generated. One of the questions um, from the virtual sites is, um, we need TA, we need professional development, we need strategies. So what does a good, high-quality, inclusive environment look like? Um, SDCs look very different from typical early childhood classes. And this we know is true. So we need to have technical assistance on physical setup as well. So we, we will have some resources for that, um, especially if we get the, the grant. But we're making plans to put those in place. So there will be announcements about how we're going to roll out the tech, more technical assistance on inclusion. So I want to go back to uh, the beginning when we talked about the survey, and I want to take a poll here. How many think it, in California it's still attitudes that are in the way and beliefs? Beliefs or attitudes? I me? Mean? Sure, pick as many as you want. How about policies? about funding and resources? <laughs> A lot, yeah. <laughs> but whole room. <laughs> it's our informal survey. And what about professional development? What's the need there? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we... <coughs> just had our own <clears throat> poll. So in the room here, we had 11 people thought it was attitudes and beliefs, 16 around policies, 18 around funding and resources, and 10 around professional development. So that's sort of our picture here. So um, before you, you wrote down some challenges, I hope, or you have some in your mind, so at your table, pick um, a challenge and then write a solution come up with some solutions to address that challenge. I'm going to give you um, about 10 minutes to talk together. Right. It could be an individual challenge, but it, you might say which box it would fall under, but it could be an individual challenge. I'm going to bring us back together. 
I hear lots of good buzz and conversation. And we're getting wonderful conversation from our virtual sites. One of the virtual sites wanted to put their vote in. So this is, symbolizes their entire room at the site. And that was their voting. So we want to acknowledge that they're part of this process as well. And we have a comment from one of the virtual sites that we're going to read to you. Hello? There was a comment from a group that said uh, there was large consensus that because of a lack of funding and resources, there can be no professional development. We feel that there's very little inclusion conversations, even in community college settings. And we believe this to also be part of the problem. We think a solution would be to allow classes and professional development to be focused on teaching children. Let's get rid of the word inclusion because it should already be built in. It's hard to pinpoint one of these challenges as the problem. They are all interconnected. Our participants do not feel that they did not receive the professional develop development they needed, and this may be where the conversation starts. Very good. Thank you to that virtual site. That was very well put. So um, we're going to be taking suggestions and strategies from in the room and also from the virtual sites. And we have a, a good time to, to work on that. So who would like to be first? Or can we go just around the, the thing? What, do you have something about attitudes that you had a solution for? Don't talk all at once. <laughs> we talked about a lot of the silos. <laughs> but um, one of the pieces that we really spoke about was the lack of the, um, ability for joint professional development. And the joint professional development at the teacher level, the practitioner level, but also the administrator level, and also um, between social services and LEAs, particularly with Early Start. The perception and the implementation of what natural environments is means something very different to LEA practitioners than they may be to a service coordinator who's dealing with insurance and setting up appointments that are very much medical models. So how was, how is that really a natural environment? But if we're all attending separate professional development sessions, then things don't ever mean the same thing across the board, and parents are completely confused as their children transition from one system to the next, regardless of their age or the type of program. Yes. Yes, thank you. Okay. And, and um, each year, um, the National Association for the Education of Young Children, NAYC, has a state... Um, team professional development team meeting back to wherever th th that's occurring and um, this previous year we made a concerted effort to make our state team be um, uh, multidisciplinary I mean, I mean across uh, the State Department so we did have Meredith on the team we also had a representative although it wasn't Aaron but we had a representative from um, for, from developmental services we had a representative um, from um, the community call anyway but across systems so that we could begin to do that and you weren't there but and neither was I because I was here but on um, but we had a state advisory council for early learning uh, that took place and and our team presented information um, to the state advisory council about how we would like to continue to operate as a um, cross-disciplinary professional development team so that we could begin to do that. So no, it's true, we haven't really done that, but we're going to be really conscious of trying to make more of a concerted effort to do that kind of thing so that the strengths or the benefits that we have and to the extent to which uh, professional development training module or whatever, whether it's from early start or from, from, that could be used for other providers so that, that we can help to promote those kinds of thing so I know we're at the infancy stage there but we are having that discussion so I did want to bring that to your information okay. can I can I follow up just I have okay, you, um, 
so one of the other things that we talked about, which I think is interesting because it fits under attitudes and how we process things, it definitely fits under policies and funding and under professional development, is as we've been all embracing the importance of inclusion and dealing with the ongoing way that different programs are embracing or not embracing natural environments, at the same time, we've lost some support systems that are really essential. Um, there are a bunch of us that are new administrators in the county office here in Santa Clara alone within the next five years. Um, and I have a good 50% turnover of my staff. And with the loss of support systems such as SEEDS and no longer having CCAP, um, we have lost the ability to come together as a state and support each other. Um, I appreciate very much everything that's happening online through West Ed and all of the different institutes, but it is not the same and will never be the same as getting together at an administrative level and getting together at a peer tutoring level because as someone who's been a, a consultation site, I have learned more from the consultations I've given to others than I have from going and receiving consultation. Um, so I hope as we look at funding and all these different grants that are coming back, as administrators, I don't know how many more ways we can say that we need that back so that we can work on all of these things that are so important for our kids and families. And I wanted, from the regional center perspective, um, the funding structure is not necessary. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Okay. The funding structure was not the decision of the early start provider and service coordinator. So insurance does conflict with. Can I say that? Insurance does conflict with natural environment, but that's not why insurance is there. <laughs> insurance there is as a deferred payment model to help fund the early start program. Way to put it. This might be a little different topic, but a few things that came in from our virtual sites. Can someone address licensing barriers? And then rather related to it is how can Title 22, uh, which would be the licensing regulations, and Title 5, which would be the education regulations, work together to serve all children? So uh, let me first talk about the licensing barriers. So. What I'm thinking that our virtual site is, is referring to is the number of times in which um, children um, with challenging behaviors or um, dis some disabilities have actually been encouraged by the licensing program analysts to be excluded from the program. And, and are you nodding to me, you know, virtually? But, but I would think that, because this, this is what I have heard has happened, um, um, they may be referring to co-location. Co-location. If they're co-located on the same campus, they can't visit each other. Licensing barriers. So it, it, it impacts their ability to co-mingle? Oh. Okay. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure the other one is also true, but I know co-mingling is a big deal in our, in, with some programs. Um, if they're on the same campus... It, it, so it, they might not fall under the umbrella or be counted for licensing or or there are other things that make that. So th that we might need to bring those uh, to have discussions with our colleagues over at Department of Social Services Community Care Licensing to the one uh, that I was thinking about, maybe that's because I've been on the practitioner side of, of the house too, is um, that I, I, I would would venture to say that the licensing program analysts are certainly aware of ADA requirements and so on, but because their primary focus is health and safety, they tend to um, err on the side of caution and, and tend to say the, the, when, when you had the, the quote from ADA that, um, that uh, they can't exclude children unless they pose a direct threat, and, and, and they actually use that to imply that it might pose a direct th threat for the child who is biting or the child who is aggressive and so on. Anyway, so the, but we are working with um, our colleagues at Community Care Licensing on those kind of issues so that that can be more addressed. But if on, in terms of whether they're licensed or not, I hadn't brought that one up, but, but those are certainly a, a concern. And um, the differences 
um, for can, can title. Can I just speak to the community care licensing thing for a second? Because I, I see it as a total red herring. I see it, um, I operated community care licensing programs for um, adults with developmental disabilities for 15 years. So I lived under those regs. I worked with those analysts. They were fine. It's all about health and safety. Who can agree to health and safety? We hear from our, whatever you call, I, we call them state pre's, and I don't, you call them something else. They use licensing regulations as a reason why kids can't be there. And that's a red herring. Yes. Licensing won't allow these children. You, you, you write your program design and you submit it to licensing. And licensing works with you. I, you know, it wasn't a perfect relationship always, but it was not an adversarial. They, they work with students with developmental disabilities all the time. They know that population of individual. But our, our local people use community care licensing as a reason to say no to the admittance of children. And it's, it's, it's sad that that agency right. is taking some of the right. hits. And, that, and, and especially that they're um, under contract with the department. We would not be happy to, to think that that was happening. Um, and so it means that we certainly do need to be engaged more in the process so that you're not confronted with that kind of, of a dilemma. I think certainly those conversations with licensing have to do with the square footage and the availability in the classroom and the number of children enrolled to make their contract and the inability to take in additional children. That's one issue. The other issue is the behavior and the need for the licensee to report unusual incidences that yes. sometimes happen when kids with disabilities are in the classroom and they may fall and hurt themselves in a specific way, hurt somebody else. And the other issue with uh, licensing that is getting in the way of inclusion is um, lack of some of the analyst understanding of the adaptations and accommodations that are in place for children that are non-ambulatory and in their determination a need that is different from what is specified in IEPs. So all three of those items have popped up in, in different scenarios that I know about. And, and so that speaks to the, the fact that we need to have more of a dialogue um, and in, in the extent to which those kinds of concerns can filter up where state partners can talk to our state colleagues, that we can work out those. Because I know we've been in conversations about um, uh, physical restraints and, and other issues that, that kind of sometimes come in, into bear. And another one is um, concerns about um, co-mingling and co-locating of programs and the challenges and the barriers that that presents. Um, um, so I, I'm not sure that we, we really have a specific answer to say, but to, that we're, we're not going to shy away from addressing the challenges and that I think that's really where our future is, is that we really face these head on and begin to look at how we can make sure that those, w whether it's the financial barriers, or the resources barriers, that, but, but that really are attentive to solving the problem, putting our heads together and making something that, that will really be viable so that we're not, when we talk about particularly high quality early care and education, that that means inclusive care um, and, and that we find a way to make that happen. Right back, I promise. It strikes me listening that now I'm thinking of the interagency federal early learning board, and they say to the states, tell us what's, what requirements are in the way, what's tripping over each other, what's contradicting, what's in your way. And now they're telling us, and we all can't wait, we're going to actually put out a joint statement together. I don't know if it'll be an FAQ, but it will be something that will help us at the state level, and it sounds like that's what you are all doing at the state level, is hearing the issues, hearing the challenges, and maybe sometimes it's going to be a simple matter of clarification. But when it comes from all of you, what a difference it will make. Right. The one that comes to mind is on the license, it says, for well ambulatory children. <laughs> and there you go, right there in, in that very statement, you have, have a, a concern. So 
Yes. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other um, solutions or things you want to bring to us to consider as we move forward, as things we might consider? We know we're going to have this opportunity for a community of practice um, ongoing conversation that all of you will have an opportunity to join that will help continue our um, conversations and have a, a platform for us to talk together about how we're going to yeah, inc increase well, opportunities. And I, was, I was just going to say a couple things that we have found that have been successful is doing some, first of all, having administrative support from the different agencies, so not only at the state level, but at the local level. So having um, the special education directors, the um, preschool directors starting to talk and have conversations to allow the professional develop the co-professional development to happen. And then ongoing coaching because I, and, and time to meet and plan, because if they're doing work together, they need to really be able to have time to plan. And that's one of the things that sometimes is lacking in our early care and education. They're working five days a week till five, 530, and they really don't have time during the day to be able to um, talk with their colleagues. Um, and then um, really that ongoing support and coaching so that um, someone is helping and facilitating some of that work as it's going, whether it's the administration or outside, it really is helpful. We had a recommendation um, at our table also. Uh, do you want to give the CD one? Or to? Okay. So we had a recommendation on a, um, something that CDE can support for policy, and that was that um, we could make the lack of opportunities for uh, inclusive settings a compliance issue, and that it's not a good enough reason to just not have a slot. Um, so that was one suggestion at our table. Great, thank you. Any others? Do we have anything from the virtual sites? Another solution, creating a voucher for families on wait lists that have children with special needs. That's a good solution. Thank you for the virtual site. I think our brains are full. <laughs> our hearts are full with the passion we've experienced. And um, I guess we will we'll break. We have a reflective session as at what time is the reflective session? 3.30? Right. So back at 3.30 for reflection and certificates. So you can continue to visit with each other and take a breath. Thank you so much. <laughs>